welcome everyone to our second new of the new series of Science for Development webinars. And this one is focused on chemistry, physics and mathematics. My name is Aaron Towers and I'm the, the, one of the development education officers for Self Help Africa and I'll be hosting this webinar. And every year, along with Irish Aid, Self Help Africa facilitates the Science for Development Award at the BT Young Scientist. These webinars are aimed at raising the awareness of that award and the criteria of, or the awards criteria of researching environmental and social issues faced by communities and regions beyond our shores and that of Europe. In this way, we are aligned to the principles behind the UN Global Goals to focus on the most vulnerable first as one principle and to leave nobody behind. So for each of these webinars, um, we are inviting a similar spread of speakers. Uh, we are inviting students to showcase projects from this year's um, event, the BT Young Scientist. And today we have Orla with us from St. Kevin's Community College in Wicklow and her award-winning project, Nettles, the Sustainable Solution to Fast Fashion. So uh, you're most welcome, Orla. Is it raining in Wicklow? Uh, not today, no. <laughs> not yet, not yet. And then each of the webinars features past a past winner of our Science for Development Award. We have um, Sean, who is joining us from University in Holland, and he won in 2019 with a project demonstrating how heavy metals can be removed from water by filtering through uh, waste eggshells. So we'll hear about that uh, shortly. You're very welcome, Sean. How, how's, uh, how's Holland in the Netherlands? Netherlands is lovely. We finally got our summer. We waited way too long for it, but now we have uh, lovely temperatures. <laughs> Glad to hear that. We we had our had our summer here yesterday, uh, and and now it's gone uh, once again. We also have um, Richie O'Shea with us, who won the Science for Development Award in in two thousand and ten, but his project on a low admission food stove also won the overall competition. So he was the overall BT Young Scientist winner in 2010. Uh, and he's now a postdoctoral researcher in U University College Cork, UCC, uh, and doing work in biofuels and bioenergy research. Welcome, uh, Richie. How, how's UCC? Uh, I don't know how UCC is. I've been working from my bedroom for the last uh, year and a bit, so uh, it's close to home, I guess. Yeah, I imagine the campus has been very quiet. And then finally, uh, we always are in hoping to have a programme scientist from the field uh, as part of the webinar, uh, Self Help Africa programme agriculture advisor. And we're lucky to have Robert Jinsi joining us from Kampala in Uganda. How are things in uh, in Uganda at the moment? Oh, we are fine. Uh, it's 28 degrees Celsius today. Um, quite very good weather. So uh, we are doing well, thank you. I, I, I wondered if I could ask to begin with Robert, because on my list here, I have your job uh, title, which includes Resilience and human, Humanitarian Development Programming Specialist. Yeah. So I, I would be really interested if you could briefly uh, inform us to what does that mean? What does resilience and humanitarian development programming mean? Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> as I've mentioned, Africa has extremely beautiful weather. Um, most places have average temperature of about 25 degrees and that most, for most of the year is, is really good with plenty of rainfall in many, many places, and especially the greater Horn of Africa. 
But ironically, um, this beautiful weather is also home for many, many um, natural disasters. We had floods in most of East African region. We had the desert locusts. We had the fall armyworm. We have a lot of landslides with very heavy rainfall. The soils are very, um, are very light and especially uh, those that are, are on ecologically fragile terrains. And so my role in the programming section is to work with smallholder farmers to be able to build their ability um, to bounce back after these shocks have happened. So we work, we empower countries, we empower communities, we empower you women, we empower youth and men one, to anticipate, to absorb, and to adapt, or even say to transform um, after these shocks have happened. We work with institutions, we work with farmer or smallholder farmers groups, we work with uh, communities to build their ability to anticipate, adapt, but also transform their lives after um, these uh, natural calamities have happened. That's a really good insight and a good place for us to start. Um, so many of those issues uh, we are barely aware of in our, in our day to day life here in Ireland. And so then how could students and teachers that are here consider such challenges when they're thinking about um, research projects? But we would like to think that with awareness of sort of global citizenship, that these are the kind of issues that students and teachers would in, uh, look into and, and explore um, because we're all connected. Uh, and we might think of locusts and, and pests and, and these problems in, in Uganda and beyond as being another person's problems, but Uganda's produce is uh, and resources that come and enrich our lives here in Europe um, are a very integral part of our lives, obviously. Thank you, uh, Robert. And just very quickly, if you permit me to make a personal um, dedication because of the to topics of this webinar, um, and as a way of inspiration, I'd like to uh, mention a lifelong scientist enthusiast who had a big impact on me throughout my life uh, and that's my uh, uncle Phil who his whole career was a physics teacher uh, and a science a very enthusiastic science nut uh, and a very humorous man as well so I could have chosen uh, you know an impressive science um, motivational quote. This little cartoon caught my eye and this image says to me that we learn what we see, you know, the power of ro role models. Phil was a very inspirational uh, person for me, always explaining the wonders of the of the world right from the mighty stars and planets right down to the tiniest molecular scale. So with this webinar, I will attempt to be like Phil uh, and with the panel's help to enthuse and inspire everyone to, to be curious and explore the wonders of science. Let's get to it um, officially. So if I can go now over to Orla, our um, student scientist who was in this year's uh, BT Young Scientist and her project on nettles that won uh, a number of awards, including the Environmental Protection Agency's Special Award. But to introduce your um, project uh, before we let you fill in some more detail, we'll just run the video that Orla created to, sh to show her project to everyone because this year's event was, was as you can imagine, uh, a virtual event. So this was her way of communicating what she had researched. 
So we'll run the video for you now. Hello everyone, my name is Orlin Gallicor and this is my project on nettles, the sustainable solution to fast fashion. The inspiration for this project is when I realised that most of my wardrobe is made from synthetic fibres. While garments can be recycled several times, it takes them 200 years to break down. This jacket is 100% polyester and children may only wear it for one season before they outgrow it. This jacket will spend longer breaking down than being worn. The tags on this jacket state that it is water resistant and to keep away from fire. Perhaps I could make a jacket of similar properties that is biodegradable and uses the same tags. Here you can see the nettles and the nettle stalks. In the next clip I will show you how I obtain the nettle fibres from the nettle stalks. Here you can see the method I used to obtain the nettle fibres from the nettle stalks. Here we have the nettle leaves that can be fed to animals like rabbits, the nettle wool that I can use for insulating clothes, and the remaining nettle stalks that can be used for animal bedding. Here we have the insulation project, where we have two beakers, one insulated with polyester and one with nettle wool. We also have a data logger here that records the temperature of the water in the beakers as it decreases. Here we have the water absorption project where I weighed out the same amount of nettle wool and polyester and put them into funnels in conical flasks. Then I measured out the same volume of water and poured it into each. After that, I weighed each wool to see which absorbed more water. Here we have the tensile strength project, where I continuously hang weights on the nettle yarn until it breaks to see how strong the nettle yarn is. the first piece of nettle wool that I spun into yarn and knitted this. As you can see I improved a lot here as I made a whole scarf. We have the jacket I made using a recycled cotton shirt and fully insulated with nettle wool. The nettle wool. When I'm finished with the scarf I can put it in my garden composter. We cannot continue to use clothes for a short amount of time and allow them to spend years breaking down in landfill and produce microplastics. Nettles provide a biodegradable alternative to providing wool and yarn to the clothing industry. With my experiments, I believe I have proved my hypothesis that nettles are the sustainable solution to fast fashion. That was wonderful and a, a, a beautiful uh, scarf as well to finish with. Um, so can I ask you that how have your thoughts of your project and your research developed since? Um, well, when I was make, doing the project, uh, I was really unsure about how people would like react to me sitting here making things out of nettles. You know, I didn't know if people would think it was a bit silly or just not really a good idea. But after winning my awards and a, a lot of I received a lot of amazing feedback. And the confirmation I got was important for me. And it, I realised how big and how valuable this project really could be. Have you had a scope to continue the research in some way? Well, I would definitely look into actually making clothes out of nettles and selling them on, you know, because I've done all my research and have found that this is the future, I think, of fashion. And, and how, how did you come to choose nettles as opposed to any other alternatives? Um, well, this all started from me in my history class. I read an article that in the First World War, Germans made their uniforms out of nettles because Britain controlled the cotton industry. And I just thought about it and I was like, you know, why aren't we doing this now? This is actually a good idea. And I did some further research and, you know, I realised that you can buy nettle wool online in places and so I bought some and I made some. And, and obviously um, nettles grow uh, very easily here in Ireland. Uh, so um, a, a local resource that is um, much maligned and, and, and unutilised. Uh, but you were saying that not only environmentally sound reasons, but as an actual alternative fabric, the properties of it were similar to what we use um, already, is that true? Yeah, so most of our clothes are made out of polyester 
and mm -hmm. I did a good few experiments to compare polyester to nettle wool and to see like is it actually possible to use it or if you know it's not going to do anything for us but I found that you know the tensile strength was perfectly fine for a normal like scarf or t-shirt and I did some water retention experiments and I found out that you know it does absorb water but if you use the right materials and experiments that it, it can do fine. And yeah. are you aware of of nettles being used commercially uh, by by at the moment by any companies either in fashion or in other ways? Uh, no, I actually haven't really heard of it at all. You might be ahead of the game there somewhere. You never know. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Great. So uh, thank you very much, Orla. Uh, we'll g move on now to to Sean, um, our 2019 winner. So, um, Sean, you used uh, an innovative way of um, uh, of a product that we would all think of a bit like nettles. You know, we walk by and ignore them or cut them down or um, or fear them. Uh, chickens and eggs are are everywhere and used in great numbers. Uh, but I've very I don't think I've ever heard of eggshells being used really um uh, much apart from maybe throwing it on on your veggie patch and something like that for for calcium but so tell us about what you discovered you can do with eggshells my project was about recycling eggshells for use in um the water filtration uh industry the problem that this project tackles is heavy metal ion water pollution um, because it can lead to sickness and death in um, those who consume it. Um, and the risk with it is that the exposure limit of these contaminants to humans is quite low. Currently, you have, um, you have solutions that can take this out. However, they're more expensive. And um, they don't come from natural resources, which is where eggshells comes in quite handy. Um, Eggshells have an affinity for heavy metal ions. That's why you can take them out of water. There are two components of the eggshell that can remove heavy metal ions. The first of which occurs on the eggshell mem or the eggshell, uh, that is adsorption. And it's important to this differ between absorption and adsorption. Absorption occurs when a substance goes inside another substance and adsorption occurs when a substance is attracted to the surface of another substance. So in this project, it was investigated the, uh, the, adsorb the adsorb adsorbent properties of an eggshell. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, we have a reaction scheme with calcium carbonate and a lead ion. Essentially what happens is the lead is attracted to the carbonate and the calcium is kicked off. So this results in a lead carbonate being formed and calcium being added to the water. So it takes out a pollutant and it adds in a, uh, a, chem or a uh, substance that is beneficial to, to uh, the drinker of the water. Um, next, we move on to a phenomenon called chelation, and this occurs on the eggshell membrane. And essentially what happens is you have functional groups on the eggshell membrane, which are able to pinch and trap a heavy metal ion. When you take the, um, the eggshell membrane out of the water, you take the pollutant with it. I did a test using water from the Avoca River in Wicklow, which is one of the seven most polluted rivers in Ireland. This is because there's a, a copper mine that's right beside it and mine water mixes with the river water and thus we have pollution. So to do the experiment, I ground two grams of eggshell into small particles and I mix it with 100 milliliters of contaminated river water. Then after the eggshells were removed from the water, I sent my samples to Waterford Institute of Technology. Here we can see the results of the analysis. Um, 
The project investigated cadmium, chromium, copper, nickel, and lead. Uh, and I think the most obvious one we can see, obvious change here we can see in the copper sample. So if we look at the red bar, that shows what the initial concentration of copper was in the water sample. And if we look at the yellow bar, we can see the final concentration. The eggshells were able to remove practically all of the heavy metal ion in, uh, in each case. Um, and this is quite important because you're bringing a, a sample of water from a dangerous level down to a safe level. How did you come up with the idea that eggshells might uh, be something that could, you, could be used in this way? Um, well, fr from chemistry, um, I knew that calcium carbonate was um, used in heavy metal ion, uh, ion exchange. And uh, I knew that eggshells contained calcium carbonate. And uh, after a little bit of uh, research, I found uh, an article which said oh, yeah, eggshells can, uh, can do this. The focus of the project as well is to um, bring this from lab scale, this lab scale process into an industrial scale process. So uh, that will involve filtering large volumes of water instead of uh, small batches. Now, it's great to see that level of scaling up uh, considered. And I know because I was lucky to travel with you early in 2020 to Zambia. We were in Lusaka and you got to present your project at these slides uh, to the students uh, and, and professors there. And they were asking you about the practicalities of scaling it up. How, how was that uh, experience? and discussion for you? Yeah, that, that was a great experience. I, I really enjoyed presenting it in, uh, in the University of Lusaka and also talking to a few people after the, uh, after the presentation who were able to um, maybe point me in the right direction to either to look at what I'd already researched or to look at something I could research later on. And they were excited because it is highly applicable to, to, uh, to Zambia. Great, and using uh an accessible resource is, is vital. Uh, again, when we think about uh, global citizenship and, and science for development, we're looking for answers. We need answers that use resources that are readily available to communities, to small holding uh, farmers and families and their communities, as well as them being environmentally sound. Thanks, Sean. Thank um, so if I could go over to, to Robert uh, in, in Uganda as a, an agricultural scientist and an advisor for Self-Help Africa. I wondered if you could, if you could tell us of any other uh, innovations in your programs. Please tell us what you're up to and, and what you're up against. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, I'll talk about uh, one or two um, projects that we are working on. One is on um, uh, using um, science to control the infestation of the fall armyworm. Uh, fall armyworm is a very, very polyphagous paste and affects a very many number of crops. So we noted that remote sensing imagery has been extremely successful in um, detecting the infestation of the fall armyworm in homogeneous fields in developed countries. But in African contexts where the fields are very heterogeneous, it was extremely difficult. And so we, using, we are using, um, in collaboration with the university, we are using um, artificial in intelligence, uh, what we would call the machine learning algorithms, which have really helped become a, a promising tool to successfully detect uh, fall armyworm infestations from drone images taken over um, above the fields at levels um, using smartphones. And so we are able to take many, many, many pictures uh, using drone. And then these pictures 
are fed into the, um, uh, the artificial intelligence program, which now kind of like gets um, an algorithm that will help us detect the infestation of the fall armyworm um, in the fields. Another project that we are working on deals with um, the problem of drought. I had mentioned that, you know, Africa has extremely beautiful weather um, with a lot of rains, with a lot of sunshine. Because of climate change, we've seen many, many changes happen in the patterns of the weather, in the patterns of when rainfall comes. And because most of the agriculture is rain fed, you find that the farmers who are re very resource constrained, they find themselves extremely at a very difficult situation when rains do not come at the right time. So drought detection has been extremely um, important for us to be able to work with our smallholder farmers be able to determine with some level of accuracy when the drought is ready to come. And so when they can do, um, they can dis make decisions around planting. We've been able to do climate uh, modeling predictions. And with this, we use the farmers uh, observations, which are very, 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 very critical in, uh, the ex in this exercise. And then we do mathematical modeling to be able to develop weather, um, weather threats calendar, and then be able to advise the farmers to be, make their decisions around planting according to the phenology of the plant. The accuracy of this, of this modeling is really depending on the, model, uh, the, the, the amount of historical data that you have both uh, weather and, and uh, rainfall, temperature, but also the indigenous knowledge by the local farmers. They have a lot of experience, those who have been doing agriculture, they have a lot of experience on some of the, um, some of the characteristics. For example, when we talk to some farmers, some old farmers, they told us, when you see a certain uh, species of birds come, then you know that maybe in the next three to six months, there is likely to be a weather, uh, a drought. And so modeling all that kind of um, information, we've been able to, you know, to develop some, um, some drought detection um, models that help us work with the farmers and advise them on when they are able to plant. Some of them have not been extremely 100% accurate, but there is some degree of reliance, uh, some degree of accuracy, maybe two months or a few weeks. And depending on the, um, the, the accuracy of the data that we've been able to, uh, to come up with, that's really uh, important things that you've mentioned there, particularly about the involvement of the farmers mm. uh, th and the use of their knowledge uh, and their ability to collect data using such things like smartphones or even just a simple mobile phone that they can share what they are seeing and what they are witnessing. Mm. Uh, I know that this is particularly important where you mentioned the, the pest um, fall army worm, which obviously is something we are not familiar with here, that it's actually a moth as well, isn't it? The adult state is a moth and it flies uh, from um, crop to crop and plants uh, the eggs uh, into the crops, in particular maize is my understanding, but I'm sure others, uh, and decimates the harvest. There are websites about being a citizen scientist, an amateur scientist. There are Irish and Euro EU on running programs that you can get involved in uh, as an amateur scientist uh, using observation and, and your our, all our access to technology like we're using today yeah. uh, and the power of the smartphone. Uh, so I'd encourage people to look up that idea of being a citizen scientist and you might get uh, project ideas from what is ongoing. 
Um, so uh, one other element I wanted you to, to share with us is the uh, massive programs across Africa and across the world of planting trees as a action against climate change uh, and protecting soils and managing water resources, all uh, part of planting trees. That's a, a, <clears throat> a global restoration monitor and it's put up and designed and developed by some of the world's um, capable development and conservation NGOs together with universities and, and research institutions. And it's intended really to be an inclusive and accessible um, platform for all stakeholders to con as, and, and it will continue to evolve um, as more information needs come, uh, come up. So the purpose of this is really to provide clear visibility to existing and planned land restoration projects and to track their progress and impact in real, in real time using consistent indicators across projects, organizations, and, 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 and countries. So uh -huh. the information is mainly to support um, and inform planning and decision-making and to demonstrate progress um, towards, you know, global development and restoration and mitigation of climate change um, around, around the world. One of the biggest attributes for this, uh, for this monitor is the, in around carbon estimation. And it uses a model that, um, that calculates the above ground carbon sequestration using baseline data. And then each additional layer of restoration, the project correlates uh, to incremental growth in the breadth, uh, breast height of uh, the, the, the breast height diameter of the trees. I'll give you an example. If we can zoom in, just one example for a project in uh, in Uganda. We have a uh -huh. one project in Uganda, in southwest of Uganda, where we are doing uh, restoration around Lake Bunyonyi. And so far, we've planted three species of trees, uh, 120,000 species of Cariandra, 34,000 species of Grevelia, and about 12,000 species of, um, of bamboo. And these really um, are helping to restore the, um, the ecosystem through working with the communities to plant trees through uh, construction of the um, soil and water conservation um, structures, and then promotion of the green jobs um, in, in that part of the area. And so when you add several of these projects here in Uganda, in Kenya, and in other countries, you are able to see uh, with this monitor, you are able to see in, a, in just a snapshot how the entire efforts, even when they are very isolated, how the entire efforts are being um, are contributing to the ecosystem restoration uh, at the global level. We'll share the, the link to this global restoration monitor uh, for people to look at afterwards. I'll just show you quickly that you, you can see the different organizations that feed in to, to this data and the different countries um, where data can be found and the donors of, of different countries and regions that contribute to, to this resource. So if I can go finally out to, to UCC, to, to Cork and uh, Richie O'Shea, if you would let us know what, what UCC and yourselves are up to in your research group uh, looking into biofuels. Yeah, uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, I suppose just a bit of background on myself. First, as you said previously, I won yeah. the Science for Development Award back in 2010 for a low efficient cooking stove. And I also won the Young Scientist um, competition itself that year as well. 
Um, since then, I went on to study energy engineering in UCC. And after that, I completed a PhD in UCC on anaerobic digestion, which is the process of converting biodegradable material, converting that into a mixture of methane and carbon dioxide. And that can be used as an energy source to power vehicles if you remove the CO2. Um, it can be used to run an, an engine and generate electricity. And the CO2 that you remove from the biomethane could be used in greenhouses to increase crop yields by increasing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere within the greenhouse. Or it could be used to cultivate microalgae. Um, as well as that, if it's food grade, it could be used in food manufacturing facilities. I think a couple of years ago, there was actually a European-wide CO2 shortage. I distinctly remember going into a couple of supermarkets and not being able to buy food because there are certain types of food because there was a CO2 shortage. After my PhD, I came back to UCC and I'm working in the bioenergy and biofuels research group. And we look at converting biodegradable materials into higher value products. So my own area would be looking at linking anaerobic digestion, so converting biodegradable waste from the food processing sector or from agriculture into biogas. And that biogas can be used as a source of renewable energy to displace fossil fuels like fuel oil or kerosene or natural gas. Um, and linking that with industry and seeing how can a large industry or small industry, like um, if you had a cooperative of smaller restaurants, for example, how they can come together and use anaerobic digestion to recover energy from their biodegradable material instead of landfilling it. And as well as that, then the residual um, semi-organic liquid that's left over afterwards is called digestate, and that can be used as a, a soil amendment or a fertilizer. And that basically you can displace um, synthetic fertilizers made using the Haber-Bosch process like calcium ammonia nitrate. And it can also help reduce our reliance on rock phosphorus, which is mined and is a fossil resource and is rapidly running out globally. We would also conduct life cycle assessments to determine whether or not what we're doing is actually of benefit to the climate um, from a greenhouse gas perspective. And we'd also inevitably have to do some sort of techno-economic assessment. My own research is a bit more holistic than that. Like I said, it's linked with uh, industry. So looking at how industry can become more sustainable and that sustainability is more than just climate change. Um, it involves how the projects being implemented by industry or by individual entities impact, yes, the environment in, for, in the form of climate change or water eutrophication or reduction in PM 2.5 emissions but also how the impact on their, you know, the human elements. So how it impacts on their employees, on communities and the surrounding environs of these facilities and on people who, you know, participate within their supply chain. So, you know, to make sure that their suppliers are treated equitably and they're given a fair wage. And finally, then it also looks at the financial element of sustainability. Um, does the project make sense because companies and individuals in, in the society we live in have to make money? So being able to assess how projects can help companies or individual entities become more sustainable, it's a balancing act between these kind of three different pillars of people, planet, and profit. Amazing. It's really brilliant to hear that this is going on uh, in, in UCC, in Ireland, such holistic uh, research. Uh, and you mentioned something there that I hadn't heard before, the, the idea of circular economy, but circular mm -hmm. bio economy uh, is really interesting. A linear economy is what we're in, where we make, we mine something, we create something, we use something for a limited length of time, like Orla mentioned with the clothes and fast fashion, and then we have created waste. So that would be a, a linear economy. So this uh, idea of a circular economy of, of things being made that can be taken apart again and reused so, and you mentioned the circular bioeconomy. Yeah, it's um, look, it's 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 a bio it's a bio based economy, similar to what Orla you were doing with your nettle um, yarn and your nettle insulated clothing. It's looking at how you can use natural resources more efficiently and in a new, smarter way to replace the non renewable elements that we use in our manufacturing process. And the whole circularity element then. Typically, it involves like recovering, again, more useful products when products reach the end of their lifetime, repairing them, um, reusing them, repurposing them. But in terms of the bioeconomy aspect, it's, it's primarily looking at how you can recover the 
um, nutrients contained within products at the end of their life lifetime to be reused within the agricultural production system again. So again, you reduce your impact or reliance on you know synthetic fertilizers, which you know if you look at the production of ammonia-based fertilizer, it's essentially natural gas and phosphorus is mined out of the ground. So being able to recover those plant nutrients in that bioeconomy circle um, reduces um, our reliance on these non-renewable fertilizers and tries to create a sort of a system, an, an ecosystem where what we use isn't the end of the line, it's just part of the chain. It's uh, quite some time since 2010 and, and you won the Science for Development Award and you won the BT Young Scientist, but where, where did all this begin for you, Richie? And how was it that you decided to make a, a science project on a, on, on a more efficient stove, on a problem that you weren't, I imagine, personally facing? Like I was in the Scouts when I was younger and we always used to light campfires and I really hated getting smoke in my eyes. I, I really did not enjoy it. Um, and I kind of thought there had to be a better way of doing this. And I suppose at the same time, my own, my own parents, um, like my father worked in Kenya as a, as a lay missionary. Um, my mother worked in Ajigunle in Lagos as a nurse. So I suppose growing up, we were always familiar with, you know, issues faced by people in different countries. And it just kind of, it just kind of clicked. I was kind of thinking one day, it's like, you know, I like lighting, I like, I like camping, I like lighting campfires, and maybe there's a more efficient way of doing it. Huge communities are, are lighting such fires or using such stoves every yeah. day. It's, it's um, like, the, like billions of people across the world still use three stone fires to cook their food, and it, re it results in huge issues with indoor air pollution, especially amongst you know women and children because most of the cooking is done by women indoors, um, kids that would be exposed to smoke as well. As well, like if it's an inefficient system, you have to use more wood, which means you have to collect more wood, which means you've cut down more trees, and it, that has an impact on ecosystem and desertification. But I think all of that came after, you know, just a, it was just a genuine interest in trying to see could something be done a bit better. Um, and that's probably what started me off on this path. And I've always kind of stayed on that you know, sustainable renewable energy research path through college, through my PhD, and now into my work as a as a lecturer in UCC. So I suppose it, it was something just that I found interesting and I just kept exploring. And what about you, Sean? Uh, you, I know you your project involved uh, pollution in, in Irish rivers, but your project seemed to have a very strong global uh, view, view to it. Well, yeah, I did the Young Scientist for the three years before that, um, and I wanted to do another project, and I knew that water pollution was a global problem, and I thought maybe using some kind of natural resource would be quite easy to, uh, to solve the problem, and I kind of ticked all the boxes for uh, a reasonably good sustainability project. Uh, and, 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 what, and what is it that you're now studying in, in the Netherlands? Uh, I'm studying chemical engineering at the University of Groningen. A lot of what we study is related to sustainability because most people doing the study will go into the chemical industry. That hasn't got a brilliant reputation for uh, sustainability. So currently we are uh, studying how to, to do it better. Maybe you and Richie uh, can, uh, can have a, a, a chat another time. If I can go back to Orla uh, as um. Most recent um, BT Young Scientist, some students and teachers will already be formulating plans for projects. Do you, would you have any advice to give? I would definitely say that it is so important to pick something that genuinely interests you. Like for me, I love clothes, you know, so I went off and made some clothes. But like there were so many times during doing my project that I just wanted to quit. But the fact that I really enjoyed doing it kept me going you know and I think that's really important for people like entering next year to actually pick something that interests you and also that no idea is too crazy you know you can make a project out of anything great um and Sean do you, do you, would you have uh, a piece of advice for the students listening um I would personally look at the likes of green chemistry green energy um food water sustainable agriculture um I think they're they have a lot of potential, and I think the uh, the judges at the Young Scientists will like to see a project about that. Great. Uh, I, I would just add that um, 
you shouldn't be uh, scared or, or shy to to ask for advice and help from from professional scientists in Ireland and beyond um, to to approach universities and and even I, I imagine like re, you know research groups like Richie is um, representing and even going further afield and 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 uh, annoying people because you're not annoying them uh, like Roberts in Uganda uh, with questions that you because that, they'd only delighted to hear of projects uh, that relate to to the work that they're involved in and and the the challenges that they are faced with uh, you be, might be surprised uh, how um, accessible these uh, institutions and professionals are so very quickly can I give a uh, pass on one question that we've had to to Robert about the problem with the pest in the crops the fall army worm uh, and how are you controlling uh, that spread of the pest and are chemicals used? In principle, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the focus is really on not using chemical control processes um, or methods. Our aim is to explore the rest of the opportunities for controlling the pest and chemicals would be really the last resort. And so there are a number of um, uh, biological options that we are exploring with the farmers and when all that fails you know uh, then we go for chemical control you need also to know that our smallholder farmers are really resource constrained so they would not be able to afford uh, most of these um, pest ke uh, chemicals and so the our our move is really to explore other alternatives and limit uh, use of chemicals for the obvious reasons of price, but also for environmental conservation. Yeah, the, these uh, field farming field schools or lab field schools that I, I know of uh, running in various programs across uh, uh, the South South Africa project countries uh, is really amazing to see that, that um, share of knowledge uh, from from the farmers upwards and and innovations coming from uh, from scientists from around the world. So I think it's a, wonderful to see that. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, so I just say thank you very much to all the panelists uh, for this webinar, looking at chemistry, physics, and maths, and I hope that to see more projects that are fit the criteria for the Science for Development Award. So thank you everyone for uh, attending. And once again, thanks to all our panelists. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.